we're going to first start off talking about what we mean by differential equations. And with any course, we kind of have to start with some basic vocabulary. Well, to not make this incredibly boring and just a list of vocabulary words, I want to talk about differential equations using, we'll say, M&Ms. Say I have a bowl of M&Ms on my desk, and let's say I start off with, we'll say, 100 M&Ms. And every hour, about half the M&Ms are gone. That is, maybe my colleagues walk by, take a handful of M&Ms. So I have my 100 M&Ms in a bowl. I'm going to call my dependent variable M, which is going to be the number of M&Ms, and I'm going to talk about T in terms of time, and I'm going to talk about time in terms of hours. I could say this, M at zero equals 100. And I'm going to make one change here. There are times I get super mathematically precise, and sometimes I get a little bit looser with my, my notation, but I'm going to be pretty specific here. I'm going to use brackets because I'm going to talk about time at definite discrete moments. That is, I'm not going to talk about 6.32 hours. I'm going to talk about one hour, two hour, three hours, etc. So m bracket zero equals 100. Well, I can already give you my first vocabulary word. This is called my initial value, and we're going to be talking about initial values a lot in differential equations. In fact, we'll talk about IVP, initial value problems. Well, right now this isn't too exciting. A differential equation has to talk about something like, say, a rate of change. If you remember the rate of change, well, that has to do with the first derivative, I believe. And if we're talking about differential equations, I'm pretty sure we're going to be dealing with derivatives. So let's say after one hour, I have this bowl of M&Ms on my desk, and let's say I only have 50 left. So at the end of the hour, I'm going to count my M&Ms left in the bowl, and there's going to be 50 there. And let's say after two hours, I only have 25 M&Ms left. After three hours, we're going to say I have 13 left. After four hours, I'll have six, and so on. So this is real life data. Not really, I haven't put a bowl of M&Ms out. The kind of data you could collect would be, say, population of fish in a pond or bacteria growth. This happens to be a decaying function, that is, I'm having less and less M&Ms each time, but you could think of something like bacterial growth. So what you're taking is a real-life situation, and you're trying to model it as a differential equation. If you can make your model match your data, then you can extrapolate that model and look at different situations, like what would happen, for instance, if I started with 200 M&Ms in my bowl. Well, right now, this doesn't look like anything that could be a differential equation. So let's look at this step by step. If I'm given a particular moment in time t, and I want to look at what happens at the next hour, what is the relationship between the next hour and the current hour? Well, it looks like the next hour has half as many M&Ms as the previous hour. So for instance, if I had looked at this at hour one, I have 50 M&Ms. At hour one plus one or two, I have half of that, or 25 M&Ms. And it looks pretty consistent throughout the data. So this is a relationship that is apparent from my actual data. Notice I haven't really done any math here other than looking at my data and noticing that there's a relationship be between one time period and a previous time period. Well, now I'm going to do something to kind of force this into a form that might lead to a differential equation. What I'm going to do is subtract mt from both sides. And why might I do that? Well, now my left-hand side looks like the change in m. And the right-hand side, I can simplify to this. Now that I see a delta, I kind of think back to Calc 1 and what happens when I make those step sizes really small and take limits. Well, hopefully it's not a huge leap of faith to say that this actually can be written as 
Notice I've gone from brackets to parentheses. That's because now instead of thinking of this in terms of discrete time periods, that is one hour, two hour, three hours, etc., I'm now making this a continuous function. And now I can throw in some new vocabulary. Actually, hopefully this isn't new vocabulary. But our t I can think of as the independent variable. And my m and m population is the dependent variable. I could also write this a little more simply. And this is known as Leibniz's notation. Sometimes we'll use prime notation. Sometimes physics uses what's called dot notation or fly spec notation. But we're not going to be reusing that too much in class. But I like to show it just so if you go to your physics class and see a dot over something, you'll know what they're referring to. They're talking about the first derivative. So if I take this initial condition along with my differential equation, then I can say the following. This is a first order linear ordinary differential equation with initial conditions. This is also called an IVP problem, an initial value problem. So why is it first order? Well, because we're talking about the first derivative. Why is it linear? Well, it's because I don't have any squared, cube terms, anything that would make this nonlinear. And then we've got the concept of what an ordinary differential equation is. So let's take these one by one. If I looked at this example, I would say this is a second order because it's the second derivative. I would still say this was linear, and I would still call this an ordinary differential equation. Again, I haven't defined that for you, but I will. If I change this just a little bit, this is still a second order equation, but now it's nonlinear. What makes it nonlinear? The y squared term. This also is nonlinear. I can't have a y multiplying by a y prime. This is still second order and it's still nonlinear. And again, this is an ordinary differential equation. What about this one? I'm guessing it's nonlinear because of the y to the fourth, but is it a fourth order differential equation or a second order differential equation? And this equation is only a second derivative, so this is still a second order. So again, the order is the highest derivative. And I'll give you another problem. What do you think? Second order, but is this linear or nonlinear? This is also nonlinear. You can't take that y and put it into another function. And that's exactly what sine is. Sine is a function. So this is also a nonlinear ODE. All right, so let's talk about ODEs versus PDEs. ODEs are ordinary differential equations. That is what we're going to be spending most of our time talking about this semester. PDEs are partial differential equations. This kind of implies that you know a little bit of Calc 3. For instance, an ordinary differential equation is something like y of t or x of t. That is, I have a dependent and an independent variable. That is, I have a single independent variable. I can have multiple dependent variables. X and Y can both depend on T, but these are still ordinary differential equations because there's a single independent variable. Where I get involved with a PDE is, say I have a heat function over a two-dimensional surface. Now I've got two independent variables. And if I were to talk about derivatives of u, I would say I was talking about a partial derivative of u with respect to x and a partial derivative of u with respect to y. Instead of the regular d's that we talk about with ordinary differential equations, partial differential equations, it's a curved d. We'll be dealing with this a little bit, but not very much in this course. All right, let me give you another example. Hopefully at this point you're pretty comfortable calling this a second order differential equation. And although I don't explicitly show it, looking at this equation, it looks like x is my independent variable and y is my dependent variable. 
Prime notation doesn't always show this as clearly as Leibniz notation. If I rewrite this in Leibniz notation, I think it's a little clearer. So the question is, is this in fact linear? I said we couldn't have y multiplying by the derivative, and I couldn't have my y inside of a function like sine. However, that limitation is only put on my dependent variable. So that means that this is actually a linear differential equation. Let's generalize this. This is a linear differential equation. I can have any function of x times my y double prime plus any function of x times y prime plus any function of x times y equals any function of x. This is a linear second order ordinary differential equation. Let's go back to my M&M &M example. I can also write this in Leibniz notation to show you explicitly what the independent variable is. This is called an autonomous differential equation. It's another important vocabulary word to know. It means the independent variable does not show up in the actual differential equation. It will in the solution, however. We don't know how to do this yet, but I'm going to tell you that if I have this coupled with this initial condition, in this case I'm going to just start with 50 m &Ms, then the solution to this differential equation is this. A solution means if I take this y and plug it into my differential equation, I get a valid statement. How would I prove this? Well, if I have my equation, y prime equals negative 0.5y, I know what y is. Now, in order to plug it into that original equation, I'm going to have to find y prime. I'm going to have to take the derivative of my y value. Again, I have not told you how to solve this. I'm just saying here's the solution. Verify that this is the solution. So if I did that, I'd find that y prime is equal to negative 25 e to the negative t over 2. Let's see if that works. y prime equals negative 0.5y is my original equation. So I'll take this and then negative 0.5 times my y. And sure enough, the left hand side and the right hand side are equal, which means I have verified this solution. Looking at the solution, I want to talk about two other vocabulary words. The transient solution, or transient term we usually call it, and the steady state solution. The transient term is what happens as t goes to infinity. That is, if I let this, this experiment run on and on and on and on, what value would I end up with? The value that I would end up with is the steady state solution. The transient term is the term that disappears. Well, if I look at this, and if I look at the limit of y as t approaches infinity, that means I'm going to have 50 e to the negative infinity. And of course, you know I can't just plug in negative infinity, but I'm being a little sloppy with my calc 1 skills, but that certainly goes to 0. So that means this term is the transient term, and the steady state solution in this case is simply y equals 0, which makes perfect sense. If I had a bowl of M&Ms and every hour half the M&Ms were gone, we'd expect at the end to have no M&Ms. We also need to talk about the interval of solution, and most of the time we'll come up with this mathematically. But in this case, I'm going to say that this solution is valid as long as t is greater than or equal to 0. That is, this equation won't work if I'm talking about negative time, but that has to do with the fact that this is a real-life simulation and the concept of negative time doesn't make sense. But throughout all of this course, we'll talk about interval of solutions and when the solution is valid. This has a lot more importance, I think, in this class than other calculus classes. So where it's critical, I'll be sure to mention it. Of course, we could also write this in interval notation, and that's what we'll usually be using. I also want to mention the difference between particular versus general solutions. So what we've been doing up till now are all particular solutions, and those are initial value problems. That is, I've come up with 
a solution. A general solution is the set of all solutions. That is, if I had a different number of starting M&Ms, my solution, my particular solution would be different. But if I had written this in terms of a general solution, I would have still been able to come up with the correct solution. So what does a general solution looks like, look like? Well, a general solution is going to have some constants in it. Let's take this differential equation. Again, this is a second order linear differential equation. And my dependent variable will be x. This is also, again, autonomous because my independent variable t does not show up in the equation. Again, we don't know how to solve this, but I could give you a general solution. And that's simply x is equal to c1 cosine of 4t plus c2 sine of 4t. Notice again that the independent variable is, very, is apparent in the solution, but because it's not in the original differential equation, this is considered an autonomous differential equation. So the question would be to verify the solution. Well, in order to verify the solution, I not only have to take the first derivative, I have to take the second derivative. So now that I have my first and second derivatives, well, actually, I didn't really need the first derivative except to find the second derivative. I'm going to plug it back into the original equation and see if this is a true statement. The left-hand side is going to be my x double prime. plus 16 times my x and my right hand side was equal to 0. And I'm pretty sure you can look at that and say yes, the left hand side does in fact add up to 0. So I have verified the solution. Another thing I can ask you to do is find c1 and c2 given a set of initial conditions. In this case, if I deal with a second order differential equation, I'm going to have to give you two initial conditions. In this case, my initial condition doesn't start at 0, it starts at pi over 2. But that's fine as long as the time is the same for my first derivative and my actual function. So how will I find c1 and c2? Well, I'm going to take my two equations, my x and my x prime and set them equal to the value. So for instance, negative 2 equals c1 cosine of 4 times pi over 2 plus c2 times sine of 4 times pi over 2. And simplifying, I see that c1 is simply equal to negative 2. Now I take my first derivative and set that equal to 1. I know what my c1 is now. And then I finally find that c2 is equal to 1 fourth. Putting this together, I find that my particular solution, given my initial conditions, is x is equal to negative 2 cosine 4t plus 1 fourth sine 4t. Again, this is my particular solution. My general solution had the c1 and c2s in it. I couldn't find my particular solution until I was given a set of initial conditions. So this has laid the groundwork for our basic definitions that we're going to be using throughout this course.